Fourteen years ago, the state of Illinois opened its own C-Max prison, a closed maximum security unit, or Supermax. The prison in Tams has 500 beds for prisoners who are deemed unfit for regular prison population. Most of them live in single cells and have little contact with others. Tams has already been the subject of a number of complaints for the way it handles prisoners with mental illness, for its reliance on isolation as a tactic. The prison at Tams got another black eye recently when the special investigator for torture with the United Nations said they might examine its policy of solitary confinement. Coming up next on the story, I'll talk with Brian Nelson. He was put in Tams when it opened. He spent 12 years there. When his sentence began, he had one hour of supervised yard time a week. Though he's out now, he's still not sure he can ever lead a normal life. A few days ago, Brian Nelson got word that he might have a chance to tell his story to a Senate subcommittee. For the very first time, senators are examining what it's like for prisoners who are forced to spend time in solitary confinement. Organizations like the ACLU and Amnesty International have said for years that solitary is inhumane and can destroy a prisoner's mental health. So when Brian got word he might have a chance to speak at the hearing, he was both excited and nervous. He's only been out of prison for two years. I mean, it's some days I feel so alive out here, and then other days I get so scared that I've just gone crazy. This is too good to be true. And it's... I spent roughly 23 years in solitary, and it's, it's what I know. Brian found out later that he will not be among those asked to speak to the senators, but he's here with his story. I'm Dick Gordon. Support for the story comes from Goddard College, offering low-residency education for adult learners since 1963, now offering both bachelor's and master's degrees in Port Townsend and Seattle, Washington. Learn more at goddard.edu. And the Redwoods Group Foundation, collaborating with Darkness to Light and local YMCAs to prevent child sexual abuse in America. D, the number 2, L, dot org. The story is produced by North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. It is co-produced by APM, American Public Media. Coming up later this hour, someone who will tell you that all that divided attention that comes with multitasking is a good thing for your brain. First, though, a story of what happens when there is no such stimulation. When Brian Nelson was 16, an older man took him along on a revenge mission. Brian says he sat in the car while his friend went inside and killed a man. By the time the case went to trial, Brian was 17. He was tried as an adult, convicted of armed robbery and murder, and he served 28 years. He made a life for himself at a minimum security prison in New Mexico. His cell was mainly open. He worked as a tailor. He repaired the guards' uniforms and walked outside to the parking lot to put those uniforms in the cars. It was a tolerable way to do time. But one morning, back in 1998, everything changed. And four U.S. Marshals walked in with automatic weapons and told me to lay on the floor. And they just started chaining me up. They drove me from Las Cruces to Santa Fe, um, the main prison in New Mexico, and then took me to the airport in Albuquerque and put me on a plane. And and did you have the opportunity to ask them, what's going on? Where am I going? Oh, I continually ask. Nobody knew. They just said they had orders to take me to uh, the airport and put me on uh, Con Air, where it's all prisoners with U.S. Marshals, and it was it was a shock. I mean, I was a trustee. I walked in and out the prison carrying scissors, shears to do mend clothes and yeah. make clothes. And car keys and everything. Yes, and most of the time when I put the officers' uniforms back in their cars, there was rifles and guns in the truck, trunk of their car, and if I was such a threat, I'm 15 minutes from Mexico. Yeah, the point is you proved that you were trustworthy at that point. Yes, yes. I mean, my cell door was maybe locked two hours a day, and that was just during count times. But other than that, I was free to roam in and out the prison at will. All right, so where did this plane take you? Uh, it, first, it took me to Oklahoma City Federal Detention Center, and I stayed there for about two days, and I kept asking what's going on, and they're like, you're on a special transport going to TAMS. 
we landed in Greenville Airport in Greenville, Illinois, and everybody's looking out the window, and they're like, wow, what are all these police here for? And there had to be 75 Department of Corrections officers, apprehension officers, state police, riot officers in full gear, sharpshooters on the roof, and they were actually there for me and about six other guys, and they snatched us off the airplane, and the sad part is I was epileptic, and it's raining, and I started having a seizure, and instead of me getting medical attention, I was slammed on the ground, and they stood on my head until the seizure was over with. And all of it was on videotape, and they, this is our procedures. Welcome to TAMS. And did you even know at that time what TAMS was, Brad? Uh, we just heard that TAMS was being built, and at that time it was just a minimum security work camp. But wait a second, it wound up being this, like, supermax place where they said they were going to put the worst of the worst and stuff like that. That's what I've read about it. Yes, there's actually two. The work camp is the one that cooks the food for the supermax. They do the laundry for the inmates in the supermax. There's a few guys, approximately 200 guys in a minimum security facility at TAMS. So you figured maybe you were going to the minimum security, similar to the kind of place you've been in in New Mexico? I I was shocked. I couldn't think of nothing. I mean, everywhere I looked, they had rifles pointed at me, um, s- semi-automatic weapons. I mean, there were so many guns, and they had state police dogs just sitting there growling in our faces we're la- as I'm laying on the ground. Then when I was placed on the bus, they set a guy in front of me, and I'm in between two riot officers, and I, and he's holding a gas canister. And if I spoke, he was ordered to gas me, and all the officers on the bus are wearing gas masks. Deputy Director Mike O'Neill came on the bus with several other officials in suits and said, you're headed to TAM Supermax. If you say a word, you'll be gassed, and you will be there for one year. That's crazy. That's like something from a movie. It's worse than a movie because it was real. <laughs> I mean, it's... I'm here. I just had visits with my mom where I could walk outside the prison and barbecue with her. This was two days before all this. Now I'm, I, mean, I had so many chains and cuffs on me. And I mean, it's like these guys are just itching to shoot me. And it's like, what did I do? I didn't catch no disciplinary report. I didn't get in any trouble. And all of a sudden, this is happening. When we arrived at TAMS, there was a gauntlet of more riot officers dressed up in orange crush suits. And they snatch me off the bus, drag me in, throw me on the ground, and literally cut the clothes off me as I'm still chained up and leave me laying on the ground. You know, and, like, and still nobody was giving you any information as to why they brought you to this prison, right? No. To this day, nobody's ever told me. I mean, there's been vague comments that they needed so many people there to make it work, that this was in retaliation for me filing lawsuits years earlier. Um, in 1984, I had escaped from Stateville, And they're saying it might be retaliation for that. But the worst part was, the first time that it came up, the people, the counselor in internal affairs, asked me why I was in TAMS. And I'm looking at them like, what do you mean? You know, and it's, how am I supposed to tell you why I'm here? You're the one who snatched me with guns and dragged me to this place. And it's, it it was overwhelming. And it's, I can't explain what it's like to have free freedom and where I'm working to get out to society, doing everything I can to learn something, going to school, working as a tailor. I mean, I was able to go to church every day from like seven in the morning till nine at night. And there may not have been priests or anybody there, but I could just walk in and use the chapel as I willed. My family could send me Christmas packages, you know, of food and stuff from home. And now all of a sudden it's, I'm the worst of the worst and I'm some monster. And I think it was approximately, I don't know, maybe a week later that my mother had questioned people at TAMS, why is he there and why can't we have contact visits? And the psychologist lady actually told my mother, we cannot let him around you because he would kill you if he got near you right now. And my mom had a fit. She, she's a suburban white, white woman that's like, what? And it pissed her off so bad that she became a thorn in the prison side. You know, it's like, this is my son. We just hugged and kissed the other day. Now you're saying he'd kill me? It was propaganda. Tell, tell me a little bit about the cell where they kept you at Tams. The cell is maybe eight foot by six foot, 
something like that. It's a, it's a big cell. The cell is completely gray. It's stark concrete. There's a window on the back wall that if you're six foot five, you might be able to get on your tippy toes and look out. Um, there's a concrete little so-called desk that sticks out the wall. There's no chair in there. There's a stainless steel combination um, toilet sink, and that's it. And a concrete slab that you put your foam little mattress on. They give you a radio? No. Television? No. Books? For the first approximately two months I was there, I couldn't even have a Bible. They wouldn't give me anything. And I think I was there approximately six months before I was eligible to get a radio of my own. And it's, I was fortunate that my mom could send me books because so many guys there don't even have reading material. Did you have contact with other prisoners while you were there? In a sense, it's I could stand in my door and scream. And that's the only way you could have contact. You just had to scream either through the door or through the venting system. Never was I allowed on a yard with them. Never was I allowed on a wing with them. Anytime one inmate moves, all the other inmates are stop movement, you know, such as if I have to go to a hospital pass. Anytime I move, I could be the only person in the tunnel, and I'm held by two riot officers, and I'm chained hand and foot. This, this is a classic, then, definition of solitary confinement, right? Yes. And when we first arrived there, they basically turned the lights off and told us we had to go to bed at 10 o'clock. And all electricity was turned off in the cells, and we weren't even allowed underwear. I mean, it's, I went maybe 10 days before I was even allowed to have shoes. Brian, have you come up with a way of trying to describe what that kind of life is like for someone who's never experienced it? It's like living in a gray box or going in your bathroom and locking yourself in the bathroom for a weekend where somebody slides your food underneath the door to you. And enduring that for 12 years, and most people, when I tell them, just do it for a weekend. Within a couple hours, they come out. They're like, I can't do this. You know, and I've had a few friends like, oh, I could do that. And they try and they can't. You know, I was like, how do you do that? You know, because they don't have their TV. I went approximately 11 years never seeing a TV. I had never seen a computer, cell phone. I had never driven a car. Brian Nelson says the hardest thing for him was trying to maintain his sanity while he was locked in solitary. He was released two years ago, and we'll talk about this in a moment. He's still not sure how well he's doing. I'm Dick Gordon from APM, American Public Media. This is The Story. I'm Dick Gordon. This is The Story. In Washington today, a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee is holding its first ever hearing on solitary confinement. They're investigating the psychological impact of isolating prisoners in U.S. detention centers. Brian Nelson was an inmate at the Supermax prison in Tams, Illinois. He was locked in a cell, by himself, often 24 hours a day. Tams is a prison that's under scrutiny after inmates filed complaints of human rights violations. Brian works now to bring those to light. He's joining us from the Chicago Law Office, where he works as a paralegal. The first six months, my wing was gassed approximately three times a month because there's inmates with mental health problems on the wing. He creates a problem. They come in with the riot, riot squad. They gas him. It's central air, so the whole wing breathes in the gas. He's the only one taken out for a shower or medical attention, so all the rest of us that ain't did nothing wrong, we're stuck in a cell with all this gas. You know, and this was routine. Another thing you'd see is inmates getting stripped out and cutting on themselves. One guy cut his finger off, another guy cut a testicle off. I had a friend there named Chris. He went on a visit with a friend and they cried because his arm looked like train tracks. There was so much scars on it from just cutting on it. And the people who did that, did they ever say to you why they did it? They're going crazy. They couldn't handle it. 
I mean, it's you're in this cell. I was not disciplinary segregation. I was considered uh, an honor inmate at TAMS even. And, and that's a weird thing to say that. I was supposed to have the most privileges of people at TAMS. And when I first arrived there, I was allowed one hour of yard per week, one shower per week for the first 90 days. One hour per week, not per day. Per week, yes. After the first 90 days, it went up to five hours a yard and two showers per week. Um, after six months, I was allowed yard for one hour every day and a shower five times a week. And then some of them, in what's called extended property reduction, they're naked in a cell for roughly eight months. Each time they smart off to an officer, they knock them back down and they have to start over. Was there a time there when you started to worry that your own isolation was starting to have an effect on your mental health? Yes. And that started after about three months. And what was the clue to you? I mean, if you're so isolated, you can't even talk to somebody about this. How can you measure uh, how, how stable you are? Because I never thought of suicide before in my life. And I actually started thinking about it there. And here it is. I had been locked up for 16 years before I even arrived to TAMS. And I had been in other programs where I was in solitary, but it was very different than TAMS. It wasn't a supermax. And I think I was at TAMS maybe three to four months before I had my first very serious suicidal thoughts. And did you ever have access to a counselor or meds, anything like that? Um, about that time, something happened where mental health started coming and saying that I had to come out and talk to them. I was at TAMS approximately six to eight months before they placed me on psychotropic medication. I had never been under psychiatric care ever in my life prior to TAMS. And the medication that you were taking, was it just to basically stone you out to make it through a day, or, or was it something different? It was a very strong antidepressant medication. It made things worse, because here it is, I'm thinking that I got to rely on medications to survive. I got to go talk to somebody, and when I went and talked to the mental health lady, she's telling me she doesn't know how to treat me because there's no courses about this. They had no idea how to help us. Even the psychiatrist that came to TAMS was like, I don't know how to do this, so we just try different medications, and if it doesn't work, we'll take you off for two weeks, and then we'll try something else. What was it that finally led you to want to take part in a hunger strike there? I read Ten Men Dead, and it's about Barry Sands and the Irish hunger strikers. Yeah, I know the story. And it was inspiration. We had a guy on our wing that did not speak any English. He had a heart problem. He took nitroglycerin. There was another Hispanic inmate that was a diabetic. There was no bilingual nurses in the prison. There was no bilingual inmate on the wing with them to translate when they were having a problem. We wanted shoes. We wanted underwear. We wanted education. You know, it's, we didn't care about the food and all that stuff, you know, which most prisoners whine about. All of our demands were like, treat us humanely. And, and, and the other prisoners in TAMS, did they also know about the, the IRA prisoners, some of whom starved themselves to death? Uh, several of them I, I slipped little notes to, and the book got passed around. And then a few of us were able to talk with sign languages out of windows at the law library, little cages. And we formulated a little list of what we thought our demands should be. And none of our demands were for coddling us or anything. It's... Get bilingual nurses here, counselors here. Let us have shoes. The shoes they gave us, if I went on the yard and I ran for five minutes, the entire bottom of the shoe would be gone. And it would take me 90 days to get another pair of shoes. You know, we wanted underwear. I mean, <laughs> why can't we have underwear? And it was just little basic things like that. And there was approximately 168 inmates in TAMS at the time and I think everybody but four either declared the hunger strike or refused the meal the very first day on May 1st. How long did you go without food? Uh, it was approximately 43 days. I was hospitalized, and 
they actually came to my cell talking about you want a phone call to call your mother before you die and I was like no that's okay she's already fully aware of what's happening and nice try you know because they were just trying to play with my head they, they pulled stunts they moved the last four of us on a wing by ourselves, and then they took like a food cart full of fried chicken put it on the wing and left it there so the smell of it was supposed to make us want to eat they played every psychological game they could trying to break us and it was until they agreed to do some of the changes we wouldn't come off and they eventually did make some changes right they made a half of them within the first six months the rest of them were somewhat implemented over a period so it was 12 years you served there right yes and and brian did you get any notice of the fact that your uh, sentence was coming to an end that you were going to be set free oh i knew that because i had a set sentence i knew what my out date was and the sad part is for almost a year before my release, I started asking people, are you going to help me get ready for this? I mean, it's, I haven't been around somebody, and I had went to a court hearing in East St. Louis with my attorneys, Alan Mills, from the Uptown People's Law Center here. Yeah. And the magistrate had them take the cuffs off me. And I was allowed to shake Alan's hand. You know, and I, I break out in a sweat. I'm nervous. This is the first human contact I've had. I mean, huh. I, my hands are free. I'm being treated like a person again. And the young lady clerk, you know, they're all looking at me like, are you okay? Because I'm looking at a flat screen TV, like, wow. I'm looking at a computer, it's like, this is a computer? And they're like, where well, you been, locked away in a cage? And I was like, basically, yeah. I mean, everything was a shock to me. And prior to release, I begged them, help me get ready. And at this time, I was on four different types of psychotropic medication. I mean. They were knocking me out every night just to make me sleep. Brian Nelson never did have a chance to acclimatize himself to life outside the prison before he was released. You're listening to the story. He says instead he was put in a holding cell with no shower and no contact for 28 days. And then they let him go. I was scared. When they take me out to the gates, they finally take the chains off. My mother's looking at me like, what they do to you? And my my picture looks so different because I hadn't shaved in almost a month. And I just looked grubby for not being able to shower. And then I had always wanted a blizzard. So my mom took me to a Dairy Queen or Tasty Freeze, whatever it was. And somebody walked behind me. And I lost it. I mean, I lost it. I panicked. Get away from me. You know, and I throw my back up against the wall. I'm thinking this guy's going to attack me. I mean, it's... People are getting too close for me, and, and I just literally lost it. I mean, <laughs> it's here it is. I'm used to having my own space, being in the cell by myself all the time, and then people are just walking where they're, they're, t- they're, they're touching me, and it scared the shit out of me. I mean, that's the only way to put it. I hope you got that blizzard on that day. Yeah, I got it. It's just <laughs> my mom and them try to keep me laughing in the car. I mean, they give me a cell phone, and I'm moving it from my mouth to my ear because I don't know how to work it, and they're giggling and laughing. And my sister's like, you know, she's on the other end of the phone, and it's it's, it's sad, really, because I didn't even know how to talk on the phone. I got to take a break. There's no rush at this end. Okay, I guess we're ready to go. Are you good to go? Yeah. Yes. Brian, how long ago were you released from TAMS? Be May, May 28th, I was transferred out of TAMS. So it's been two years. Two years, yes. Yeah. And, 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 and was there a point in that period when you began to think, I am going to be okay. I am going to make it. I've got the kind of strength of character that you know, that I need to, to actually start helping other people by telling my story? No, because I, I actually believe I've gone crazy, and this is just a dream, and I'm still in Tams. I'm afraid I'm going to wake up, but I'm still there. And it's, everybody looks at me when I say that. It's like, how do I know I just haven't lost my mind? I mean, it's some days I feel so alive out here, and then other days I get so scared that, 
I've just gone crazy. This is too good to be true. And it's, I have only known what it's like out here for two years. I spent roughly 23 years in solitary my entire prison time. And it's, it's what I know. And I get family members, loved ones, they all tell me, it's, you're not in prison no more because I still sometimes think and act like a prisoner. You know, it's, somebody asks you, what are you doing? I said, what, I got a check-in warden? Huh. You know, it's... I know that one of the things, one of the tasks that you have set yourself, though, is telling the story so other people know what goes on behind those closed doors. And And I wonder... You know, when you imagine the opportunities that, that you hope to have to speak to to politicians, opportunities like this when we're talking and other people are, are listening in, what is it that people need to know and don't know? We're human. We're human. And each time I talk about it, it, it knocks me back so far. But there's so many guys still going through it. And this is just one of the types of torture going on. Torture. You use the word torture. It's torture. No matter what anybody says, what they did to my brain. I mean, I don't understand what happened to me in that cell. I don't understand what that gray box did to my brain. Because, I mean, I scream at night over it. I don't scream about the beatings. I mean, the night terrors are real. And it's, you degenerate. All through history, every time there's been a study about solitary, it says the same thing. You know, either the guy's going to go so crazy, he's no use to society ever again, he's going to become suicidal, or he's just going to be a zombie. So, Brian, I want you to do something for me if you can. I suspect that even after listening to what you've just told me, there may be one or two people listening to our conversation who are thinking to themselves, well, the guy committed a crime. And this was the punishment that he was given for committing the crime. And, and, and that's the way the system's supposed to work. How do you answer that? Um, one of the conditions of my parole answers that. They wanted me to have a reintegration evaluation. And if I didn't have that, they were going to send me back to TAMS. What they wanted to know, literally, from a doctor was, did this solitary confinement make me a homicidal maniac? This is what the Department of Corrections wanted to know, if I was going to come out here and kill a bunch of people from being in solitary for so long. So the department itself was asking the question, if, if what they'd done to you had turned you... In Crazy. A, yeah. yeah, and this is written down in my parole requirements. And it's like, how could you, you do this to me, not give me a chance to be around a human being again, and then be so worried that I'm going to do this, and they just... What they want to do is make sure they're not liable for it. Right. That if I go out here and snap, oh, well, it's their fault because they didn't make sure and do some follow-up checking on me or anything. And then the, the other sad part is 95% of the guys in solitary confinement in the United States are coming home. Most of the guys in TAMS are coming home within three to five years. And now they're, they're finally looking at it at a different perspective because there's so much attention coming to this. So, Brian, just one more question, and it's, and it's this. You've got uh, people around you who care about you and love you. You've got work with the law office. You're, you're, you're busy. You're doing important work. Although you say that there's times when you don't know if you're still in the gray box or not, are there also times when you think, I'm going to get through this? It's when I was typing up my testimony, and I started a Sunday. And my girlfriend's sitting there, and she's like, why are you doing this? Because every so often I just start crying and have to walk away. And I'm telling her, I'm trying to type it out of my head. And it's days where as I walk into, walk into work, and I'm brain dead, and everybody's like, you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm, my brain's just not working today. You know, because it's stuck there. My cell, ha my, I call it my cell, my office is upstairs. <laughs> I have an office about the size of my cell in Tams right. with no windows. I've been offered many different offices here with windows and whatever, and I don't want them. When I'm working with the guys, I want to be right there with them, you know, right back where I was, and I'm on my computer, and I'm able to do the things that I couldn't do there to help change it. You mean in a strange sort of way there's something comforting about that, the size of that space? Yes, it yeah. is. And it's maybe it's survivor's guilt because I'm out here and they're there, but it's 
I couldn't help him as much if I was still there. Brian Nelson joined me from the Uptown People's Office in Chicago, Illinois. He works there now as a paralegal. 